August the 4th, a devastating explosion tore through Lebanon's capital, Beirut, destroying large tracts of the city. The blast took at least 172 lives and fueled violent protests that left hundreds injured. But the disaster also sparked nationwide efforts to help relieve the situation. It saw people stand together in the face of crisis. Young volunteers mostly led the cleanup efforts. Mohamed Magiabar is an architecture student. He was among a team helping to clear debris. We're doing whatever we can to help the people since our politicians, our elected officials aren't even there. Residents who saw their city destroyed and their daily lives disrupted were moved by the outpouring of generosity. Everyone is helping each other. Some are distributing water and food, and there are others who are cleaning, and everyone is helping. All the youth and women are working, and no one's telling anyone to come and do so. Tens of thousands of people have been facing a humanitarian crisis since conflict broke out in Ethiopia's northeastern Tigray region in early November. The UN Refugee Agency has registered at least 50,000 Ethiopian refugees crossing into Sudan since November 6. And it scaled up its humanitarian response to assist them. Salam Kanush is a university student and Syrian refugee. He has been living in Sudan for four years after fleeing the violence in his home country. As a volunteer for the Italian aid organization COOPI, Kanush works on purifying water, setting up transport routes, and locating water resources. He says his mission is to prove refugees can help bring about significant change and be part of the solution rather than just a problem. In Sudan, here I, I wanted to give an example that the refugees are not really problems. Now we hear about refugees that are related to sadness and poor people, they are always in need, but we are not like that. So some people can really make a change. Kanush has also volunteered in other refugee camps during his time in Sudan and has founded an organization that empowers women and youth to start their own businesses. The coronavirus has added to the hardships faced by many of Brazil's poor. Several months into the pandemic, the nation still has the third highest case numbers in the world. In a poor community in the city of Santo Andre, many families like Nadia Cristina and her husband lost their means of earning an income as COVID-19 restrictions were put in place. And they've had no savings to fall back on in case of such an unexpected emergency. We were desperate. What would we do with no money, nowhere to escape to or what to look for? To provide support for those families to stay afloat, the BRICS Development Bank approved an emergency relief loan for one billion U.S. dollars to help Brazil safeguard the incomes of the most vulnerable. This comes as the government is struggling to cut its own spending and balance its books. The emergency aid has been an essential lifeline for millions of people who've lost their livelihoods due to the pandemic. From the economic point of view, the emergency financial aid was able to keep uh, income and consumption and uh, employment uh, at uh, reasonable levels. In other words, uh, Brazil could have been much worse uh, in the absence uh, of the financial aid. Poverty may feature less in the public discourse of developed countries, but that doesn't mean it's not there. In Japan, a staggering 16 percent of children are living in poverty, one of the highest rates in the developed world. Even here in Tokyo, one in ten children suffer from poverty. They can't eat till they're full and their mothers skip meals to feed the children. A grassroots initiative is hoping to raise awareness of child poverty in Japan and bring relief to children in need. It's part of a program called Kodomo Shikudo, or Children's Cafeteria, which is running about 3,700 centers throughout Japan. 
Some of them are open, which means the location and schedules are open to the public, but others are closed and private. We do this because of the stigma for families facing economic difficulties. Once a week, a group of volunteers gathers food donations and prepares meals for dozens of people in this neighborhood. They're concerned at what they say is a steady growth in child poverty in the country. Volunteers are determined to continue providing support to struggling families as COVID-19 keeps taking its toll. The group's volunteers say they feel more needed now than ever. Kibera in Kenya is home to one of Africa's largest urban slums, and it's no surprise that the area has also been among the hardest hit by COVID-19. The impact of the coronavirus has left many people unemployed, and families not knowing how to get their hands on the next meal. Mary is one of them. She has three grandchildren to feed. <laughs> Since I lost my job, life has been a struggle. I've been selling candles and nuts to feed the children. With the current pandemic, getting food is hard. To try to alleviate the suffering, a group of young Africans has been striving to find sustainable solutions to issues they see all around them. They're among the teams taking part in an initiative called the China Africa Idea Lab. One youngster visits Mary in her rudimentary home. As well as hearing her story, she also offers some practical help in the form of a crowdfunded voucher for food and daily necessities. I'm not going to hand over this voucher to her, and I'm also going to escort her to where she's going to shop. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy because I'm helping. These young Kenyan journalists are playing their part in highlighting people's needs because it's only if they have an adequate food supply that people can stay at home. And that's key to slowing the spread of the virus and stopping a vicious circle of poverty and vulnerability while the world waits for life-saving vaccines to be rolled out. The COVID-19 pandemic and other disasters and conflicts and made 2020 a year that few of us will easily forget. But many people's acts of humanitarian spirit and empathy will also be remembered for more positive reasons.